Good evening, everybody. Glad to see so many with us. Um, in the chat box at the top, I did put my email and phone number. So if you have questions um, about anything on your entomology, I would be glad to help you. The one thing is um, on my email, it capitalized my first name and it should not be capitalized. It should be all small letters. Um, I'm going to start off with a definition of invasive species and then go into the Asian giant hornet. So with that, um, if you will forward the next slide, please. What is an invasive species? Okay. It's an organism that causes ecological or economic harm in a new environment where it's not native. That means it wasn't, it's not where it originally came from. They're capable of causing extinctions of the native plants and animals, reverse, reducing biodiversity or reducing the number of animals and plants in that area. They compete with native organisms for limited resources and they can alliterate or destroy habitats. They can harm both natural resources in an ecosystem as well as threaten human use of those resources. Next. They can be plants, animals, pathogens, or microorganisms. It's not limited to just insects or just fish or anything. It can be lots of things. Other names for invasive species include alien, exotic, injurious, introduced or naturalized, non-native, non-indigenous, nuisance, or noxious species. Next. How do we get invasive species? Some of the ways they can become in on a ship ballast water, which is the water a ship takes in and puts out to keep it balanced in the water and keep it floating. It can come in on firewood, on shipping pallets, on plants, by accidental release, and by human people. Humans are the primary means of invasive species introductions now. Next. Invasion of long established ecosystems by organisms is a natural phenomenon. Things move, maybe a drought takes it there, maybe hurricane winds take it there, but human facilitated introductions have greatly increased the rate, the scale, and the geographic range of invasions. For millennia, humans have served as both accidental and deliberate dispersal agents. Next. Invasive species, most introduced species don't survive in a new habitat. They don't have the evolutionary adaptations to adjust to the challenge posed by the new surroundings. It's like if we took a ladybird beetle or a ladybug and put it in the desert, it wouldn't survive because aphids don't survive in the desert. It's too hot. Their bodies can't stand the temperatures. Some introduced species may become invasive when they possess a built-in competitive advantage over indigenous species in an invaded area. Our Asian giant hornet is one of those. Next. Under these circumstances, new arrivals can establish breeding populations and thrive, especially if the ecosystem lacks any natural predators capable of keeping them in check. Next. Rabbit. Introducing next, the Asian giant hornet or Vespa mandarina. And there it is. Next, next, the native range for these wasps, and they are a social wasp like our bees and others are in Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia, the mainland Southeast Asia, all this kind of right in here. Next.
taxonomy or how they fit into our our ecosystem. They belong to the animal kingdom, to the phylum Arthropoda. Next, to the class Insecta. Next, to the order Hymenoptera, wasps, bees, and ants. To the family Vespidia. Next, to the genus Vespa, and to the species Mandarina, or the Asian giant hornet. Next. This is just a picture in general of wasp, ants, bees, body parts. Um, in particular here, notice that here on the front part of the head in front of the eyes is the clypheus. And on wasp, right back here, there's a big area behind the eye. This is the genet. And we're going to talk about those body parts in a little bit. Next. Characteristics, next. Asian giant hornets, including the color form referred to as the Japanese giant hornet, is the world's largest hornet, measuring up to two inches or a little more long. Despite its large size and distinctive markings, people often confuse them for other species, mainly out of fear. Next. Although the scientific literature and official government sources continue to refer to this species by its established common name of an Asian giant hornet, the popular media have taken to using the nickname murder hornet. And we'll talk about why in just a little bit. Next. Regardless of the sex, the hornet's head is a light shade of orange and its antenna are brown with a yellow orange base. Next. I'll bring the picture up. Okay, its eyes, compound eyes and ocelli, here and here are dark brown to black. It's distinguished from other hornets by its pronounced clyphus, which is this right here. And you can see it's kind of a knob that bulges out. And it's large genet right here. It's orange mandibles, contain a black tooth right in here that it uses for digging. Next. And on this picture, you can see that black tooth right in there. And it not only digs with that, that's what it damages other insects with. Okay, next. The thorax is dark brown with two gray to brown wings varying in span from 35 to 75 millimeters or one and three eighths to three inches. Next, go ahead and bring the picture up. Its forelegs are brighter than the rest of the legs, the mid and high legs, and the base of the forelegs is darker than the rest. Next. If you look right here, you, okay, you can see those legs. Adult wasps and hornets have a definite waist. So next. And you can see right here, this is what they call the waist. Here's a side view. And there's a definite split right in there between them where bees don't have that definite split. So next. And you can see here in this picture, that definite waste is not there, like we have on our wasps. Next. The abdomen alternates between bands of dark brown or black, which you can see really well here, and a yellow orange hue consistent with the head color. The sixth segment, this one right in here, is yellow. Next, bring up this other picture. 
The stinger is typically six millimeters or a fourth inch long and delivers a potent venom that in cases of multiple hornet stinging simultaneously can kill a human. That's why they got the name murder hornet. And we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a little bit and why that sting is so potent. Next. The queen is considerably larger. The queen here is on the right than the workers. They can be over two inches long, while workers are usually between an inch and three eighths and an inch and five eighths. The reproductive anatomy is consistent between the two, but workers do not reproduce. They are a female, but they don't reproduce. Drones are the males, are similar to the female, but they lack stingers. In most all hymenoptera, the males don't have a stinger. Okay, next. Larvae cocoon themselves in their own silk in the late stage. And you can see that in these two cells right here. They put the silk over the top. Larva and silk proteins have a wide variety of potential applications due to their wide variety of morphologies, including naggy fiber forms, but also sponge, film, and gel. There is a lot of research going on with wasp and bee silks and the honey from bees in the medical field. Um, they are using this sponge-like material to cover wounds. It's breathable. It does not allow bacteria to grow. Um, it can stretch so they can cover something that they need to keep sterile and yet inject or put liquid antibiotic on it or in other things to treat wounds. Um, honey is one thing that bacteria does not grow on. So they use it to treat burns. And there's just a lot of things going on with these type of insects in research at this time. Next. Aging giant hornets prefer to live in low mountains and forests while almost completely avoiding the plains and high altitude climates. This mandarina creates nests by digging or co-opting pre-existing tunnels dug by rodents or occupying spaces near rotted pine roots. This one here does happen to be in a tree. Um, next, this one here is in a rotted tree stump. Any questions so far? Okay. Don't, don't murder hornets kill people. Don't murder hornets. Yes, we will talk about that here in just a little bit. Mm -hmm. We will talk about that. Their nesting habits. Some more. Ooh, I'm not showing up. There it comes. They nest in low mountain foothills and lowland forests. As particularly dominant species in their native habitat, no efforts are directed toward conserving them um, or its habitats. And they're common in areas of low human population or disturbance. Unlike other species of Vespa, um, they almost exclusively inhabit subterranean nests. In a study of 30 nests, 25 were found around rotten pine roots. In another study, nine of 56 nests were above the ground. The rest were all below ground. Um, they like rodents, snakes, or other burrowing animals. They like those burrows that have been abandoned. Um, the depths of these nests run between six and 60 centimeters or two to 24 inches. The entrance at the ground surface varies in length from one to 24 inches, either horizontal, inclined, or vertical. There's not much difference in preference there. They make do with whatever there. And the queens that found the nest prefer a narrow cavity. They don't want something big and broad. They typically lack a developed envelope. That means like when you usually think of a hornet's nest, it's big and round with a covering on the outside. These guys don't do that. They don't put that covering around the outside. 
During the initial stage, the envelope is an inverted bowl. As the nest develops, one to three rough sheets of combs are created, and often a single comb are created simultaneously and infused into a single comb. Next. Okay. There's a main pillar that goes up to the center in here that you can't see. And sometimes there's secondary pillars that connect the cones, but they usually have four to seven cones. You've got here one, two, three, four, five, six in this one. The top one is abandoned after the first summer and left up there to rot. It mainly just protects the top. The largest cones usually in the middle. Um, the largest combs are usually 19 and a half by 18 inches with 1,192 cells or so, and usually around 24 to 19 inches in elliptical, and they're wrapped around a root system normally if they're in the ground. Next. Okay. This one is a hornet's nest in the hole of a tree trunk. This one is wrapped around the tree limb. As you can see here, there's no envelope around it. You can just see the cones all piled on top of each other on this outside one. Next. Next. Is it not going? There it goes. Both of these are in ground nests. Um, you can see the hornets waiting at the edge of the nest on this one. They're the, they're the guarding, watching for anything that might come by that might disturb the nest. Next. There's three more in-ground nests here. Um, this one's just at dirt level. This one you can see at the edge of the pine roots. And here you've got a whole bunch lined up at the mouth. These are all males waiting for the female. And we'll talk about that when we talk about life cycle. Next. Okay, they have four distinct periods during their life cycle. Next. In the spring, a fertilized queen emerges after surviving the winter. She usually climbs under some bark of trees or down in some leaflet or something to survive. She enters a pre brief pre-nesting stage in late April. She feeds on the sap of oak trees at this point. Although this timing is consistent among hornets, Vespa mandarina dominates the order. In order, they're the top wasp in the area if they're there. They receive preference for premium sap resources and they won't tolerate other insects around those sap sources. Um, there is a hierarchy among the queens. The top ranked queen begins feeding while the other queens form a circle around her. Once she feeds, then the next highest ranking queen feeds. And this repeats until the last queen feeds. But if there's not enough food, that last queen may not get anything and she may not survive. Um, the ones toward the end, if there's very many, they don't get enough. They may not have enough energy to go ahead and reproduce and make a new colony. Next, as the queen is feeding, she develops her ovaries. The nutrients in the oak sap cause her ovaries to develop. And then she looks for a suitable nesting site. She usually nests in a pre-existing underground cavity with a narrow opening such as a rodent burrow. Next. Summer. Once an inseminated queen selects a suitable site, she enters a solitary phase. Next. 
During this time, she alone is responsible for building the nest, foraging, laying eggs, and caring for the young. She creates this small shell with a few cells in it, and she raises it up to where there's around 40 workers. When around 40 workers have been raised in the nest, it colony enters a new phase. The queen becomes nest bound and stays with the nest and doesn't go out anymore, and the workers assume all the duties outside. Next. Workers begin the work outside the nest above the hive in about July. Queens participate in the activities outside the hive until mid-July. Then they stay in this nest um, and allow the workers to do the other duties. Early August, you can see a fully developed nest containing three combs. So you can see one, two, three here. Um, holding 500 cells and around 100 workers. After mid-September, no more eggs are laid, and the focus shifts from caring for those young larvae, or shifts to caring for those young larvae. The queens die in October. Next. Late summer, early fall, when there are many workers, the colony begins producing the males for the next year's queens. Workers feed these new reproductives within the nest because reproductives do not forage. They don't go out and find their own food. To obtain food with high protein, the hornets may attack the honeybee hives in the late summer to early fall. And you can see here, this hornet's attacking the bees. They kill all the adult bees and leave them at the bottom of the hive. And then they remove the hive's brood, the young ones, and taking the bee larva and pupa back to their nest where they feed the hornets that are in the nest. Um, they will attack, they like honeybees. They will attack other bees and wasps at this time, but honeybees are one of the ones they really, really like. So this is one of the reasons why we don't want them in the United States, because it will severely damage our honeybee industry if they get established. Next. In the fall, the males develop and leave the nest before the females. They will perch at the entrance of a nest, and you can see this group waiting all around here to mate with the new queens. The queens will emerge about a month after the males. New queens must mate before overwintering because males will not be present in the spring when the queens come out. So if they don't mate in the fall, they cannot reproduce in the spring. Males and new queens take on the responsibilities in mid-September and mid-October. During this time, their body color becomes very, very bright, and the weight of the queens increases about 20%. Any of you guess why her weight would increase so much? Why does she need that much more weight at, in the fall? Hibernation. You're right. She's got to have that fat reserve to carry her through the winter and the males don't survive the winter. So they don't gain it. Once the males and the queens leave the nest, they don't come back. Um, the males wait outside the entrance until the queens emerge. Once the queens emerge, the males intercept them in midair and uh, pull them to the ground. They copulate from eight to 45 seconds. After this, the males return to the entrance to wait for another queen. Um, the newly mated queen leaves to hibernate. Many queens, up to 65%, attempt to fly off to fight off the males and leave unfertilized, at least temporarily. After this episode, pre-hibernating queens are found in moist subterranean habitats. And if the queen does not mate here, then a lot of times she won't even survive till spring. When the sex individuals emerge, the workers shift their focus from protein and animal foods to carbohydrates. 
the last six individuals to emerge may die of starvation because the workers have quit providing the high protein food of the bee larva for them. Next. In the wintertime, after mating, a new queen will spend the colder months overwintering in sheltered spot that she's excavated in the soil or under rotting wood or straw or something. The cycle begins again the following spring when the new queens emerge from overwintering. You can see here this Asian giant hornet. This is the European hornet. And you can see a little bit of difference, but the, the Asian giant hornet is quite a bit bigger. They have more bands here. This is more like our cicada killer in the European hornet. Next. What do they eat? They feed primarily on larger insects and colonies of other eurosocial insects like bees, tree sap, and honey from honeybee colonies. They get their food by stinging. And there again, you can see them killing the honeybees before going into the nest to empty their nest. Next. And here you can see a hornet getting ready to come into this beehive. And the honeybees have already sensed that it's coming. And here, one's got it and getting ready to just clip it in half. Next. Asian giant hornets attacking honeybee hives, destroying them in mere hours and decapitating the bees in what scientists call their slaughter phase. They then take over the hive, feeding their own young with honeybee eggs and larva. They, why, they do attack the other insects, but they don't decimate the entire population like they do with a honeybee hive. Um, honeybees are going to totally attack and, and try to keep the hornets from killing their hive just as long as there's an adult alive that can do so. So they're a little different than some of the other insects. I'm going to stop here a second. Any questions to this point? Okay. Asian giant hornets and Asian hornets are similar to European hornets, but they are not native to the United Kingdom. They are originally, again, from Southeast Asia. The invasive hornets made it to the United Kingdom in 2016, but have not increased significantly in numbers there. The Asian hornet, Vespa volutia, which came from China, however, is invading the UK and having devastating effects on their native bee populations. They're, the way they act is very similar to our Asian giant hornet, and that's one we're studying to see how to kind of combat these insects here. It was first reported in the Vancouver Island area of Canada in August of 2019. Three hornets were found in Nanningmo, Vancouver Island, and a large nest was found and destroyed shortly thereafter. And you can see here is their current locations where they have found nests. Next. A beekeeper in Custer, Washington, near the Canadian border, reported finding piles of decapitated honeybees near his hives. The evidence was mounting that these hornets were successfully making their way onto this continent. Next. At the end of September 2019, a worker was reported in Blaine, Washington. Another worker was found in October and on December 8th in Blaine. Two specimens were collected in May 2020, one from Langley, British Columbia, which is slightly up here, um, 
and about eight miles north of Blaine and one from Custer, Washington, nine miles southeast of Blaine. Next. So the race was on to keep these hornets from spreading in the Pacific Northwest. One queen sighting on June 6, 2020 from Bellingham, Washington, 15 miles south of Custer. An unmated queen was trapped on July 14th in 2020 near Birch Bay, Washington, six miles west of Custer. A male hornet was captured in Custer on July 29th, 2020. And a hornet of unknown cast was reported on August 18th, 2020 in Birch Bay, and another was trapped in the same area the following day. So everything was rotating right around this area in here. Next. You can see the red dots here were where they had positive IDs on the Asian giant hornets. The yellow dots were they had something turned in, but they haven't processed and haven't definitely confirmed it yet. These other orange ones were things that were turned in, but they were not Asian giant hornets. Next. Three hornets were then seen and two killed southeast of Blaine on September 21st and 25th in 2020, and three more were found in the same area on September 29th and 30th, prompting the officials to report that attempts were underway to pinpoint and destroy a nest believed to be in the area. Officials successfully tied tiny radio trackers, which you can see here and here on the hornet, to three hornets with dental floss and one led them to a tree near Blaine, Washington. Next. And you can see here, the little radio tracker on the Hornet and here is the receiver that picks up those radio signals that they tracked with. Next. On October 3rd, 2020, the Washington State Department of Agriculture announced that a nest was found 8.3 feet above ground in the cavity of a tree in Blaine with dozens of hornets entering and leaving. And you can see why the little arrow, the hornet going into the nest. Next. The nest was eradicated the next day, including the immediate discovery and removal of about 100 hornets. After analysis, it was determined that the nest contained about 500 live specimens, including about 200 queens. Some of these specimens were sent to the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and you can see here on the deal that the nest length was 14 inches long, had six combs, had six unhatched eggs, 190 total larvae, 112 workers, nine males, 76 queens, and 108 cap cells with pupa. So it had it was a large working nest. And you can see this man's holding up this funny looking space alien suit. The team that worked on the nest, wore these protective suits to take to extract the hornets. They had face shields because Asian giant hornets have been known to spray venom that can cause debilitating eye, in eye injury that's permanent. However, in the news conference on October 26, Sven Spieger, who is the managing entomologist with the Washington State Department of Agriculture, said that it was cold weather that day. They were lucky that hornets were docile. And so they were able to eradicate the nest fairly easily without anybody getting hurt. Next. Here you can see part of the team in their hands is the vacuum unit that the net, the hornets they vacuumed out are in. Next.
here they're preparing to get to the nest. They've got their scaffold up. Um, they're getting the vacuum unit ready here. They've got their generator back here. And also there's a unit on here to put carbon dioxide into the nest once they've got the live ones out to make sure that they've gotten them all killed. Next. Okay, to get rid of the nest, they jammed foam into the entrance hole. Then they covered the tree with plastic wrap that you can see there. Then they did that to seal the nest off so they didn't lose any hornets. And then they cut a small opening in that wrap and you can see the tubing going up along the tree and him putting it into that hole. Um, and then they, they sucked out the hornets with the vacuum into that chamber. Next. And they were contained in that chamber. You can see the chamber down here, the vacuum unit. And then they pumped carbon dioxide into the cavity of the tree to stun and kill any that they might have missed. Next. And there you can see up close all those hornets in that chamber. The hornets were put into dry ice and kept for a number of research projects in the United States and other parts of the world. Some were sent to labs to be studied. Some were sent to the Smithsonian to be put in the NMNH biorepository permanent cryogenic collection. And you can see the gentleman there with one of the specimens in that collection. The nest site was cut out of the tree and taken to the lab to study. And you can see the log that they cut out there. Next. And here they split the log. They've taken each of the layers and moved them. And they're pulling the larva out to make sure that they get all of those and make sure that they got them all killed so that they will not reproduce and grow into adults. Next. Here you can see that nest inside the log. And on the right is the small initial cap that the first queen produced. And then the rest of the layers that top layer has been abandoned and these middle layers were where the live insects and the live larva were found. After considering the captures of individual hornets in Birch, Blaine and Custer, which were all relatively far from the discovered nest, it was announced that several undiscovered live nests were believed to exist within Washington state. However, cautious optimism was expressed by the officials saying that it might still be possible to eradicate the hornets before they became endemic to the area. A Canadian official said that although individual specimens have been found in Canada and some nests were suspected to exist there, the presence there seemed to be only in near border regions and the center of the invasion seemed to be in the Washington state. Next. On November 2nd, 2020, another individual was found in Abbotsford, British Columbia. As a result, the British Columbian government asked Abbotsford beekeepers and residents to report any sightings. On November 7th, 2020, a queen was found in Alder Grove, British Columbia. DNA analysis determined that that specimens collected in 2019 from British Columbia and Washington were from two different parent populations. That was not good news. Some came from Japan. The ones in British Columbia came from Japan. The ones in Washington state were from South Korea. <coughs> 
The reason that's not good news is that meant that introductions from over there had come close to the same time, but there had been more than one introduction of queens, so that that meant there could be more invasions than we had originally thought. Next. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> How the hornets arrived in Canada and the United States, we're not clear about, but it's suspected that they traveled in cargo on vessels like this during ocean going vessels. Next. <clears throat> Most likely a quarter queen entered Canada via a shipping container like this in the packaging and created the colony that was discovered in 2019. More than 19,000 cargo containers like this arrive daily at U.S. ports. So the inspectors can only glance, do a little bit. By finding something coming in is almost impossible with that amount. So that's why this is really scary that they came in. Next. <clears throat> Preventing the new hornets from becoming established in North America is important as they could have a significant impact on our honeybee populations and the public enjoyment of parks and forests as campgrounds. If they establish a colony somewhere that's a campground and someone gets too close, they're gonna come out, they're gonna sting multiple times and they can kill somebody. Okay. There is little concern about whether they can expand to the colder and drier regions of Canada. No sightings have been reported yet on the East Coast. It's still unclear whether they can survive and propagate in the Pacific Northwest. The mountains and the temperatures are similar to their Asian home, but the types of trees that support hornets in the early stages of their lives, such as oaks, are not very common in Canada, Canada's coniferous forest. Coniferous means they're evergreen forests. The oak trees aren't there. So they're probably not gonna expand that way. They're gonna come back towards the United States and up in Washington state and things like that. The Nanamo nest was thought to have been started by an imported fertile queen. Um, time will tell if there's more. Time will tell whether or not we have more than the two different species from over there. Um, hopefully genetically, hopefully we don't. How do we control and prevent the spread? Um, vigilance, watching, preventing new colonies from becoming established. Um, attention to cargo items where insects can hide, such as wheel wells of cars is important. And it's speculated that railway shipments could potentially spread the hornets inland as well up, up the coast if we get them started. So those are being examined more closely. Um, this is the British Columbia contact to report invasive species. So we have several places now where people think they may have some where they can report. Um, this is British Columbia's next. The Washington State and the, and the extension program there are collecting the data from almost all the sources and putting it together for everybody. Next. Washington State has set traps. Next, like the one that's gonna come up in the picture that are filled with orange juice. This is used to capture the live hornets. They're also using live traps and sentinel hives, which are hives with a grate on the front that lets the bees go through, but the hornets can't get through. Um, and the goal is to find and destroy any other nests that remain. Next. This is the 2020 map. Um, of trap locations like those bottles we just saw that they have put up. This right in all and down in here is Washington State. The red ones are where they have positively caught hornets. Um, these again are where they have set traps. 
2021. Um, there are a few more red dots in here. Have not caught them down in these localities, which is good news. Um, the spread seems to be right in that small area. Using the known ecological niche, whoops. <laughs> Next. Using the known ecological niche of the Asian giant hornets and the average rate of the spread of the related species in Europe, researchers have put out a map of the potential spread in the next 20 years if the species isn't eradicated. The hornets have been found so far in Washington state and just across the border, right in here where these little dots are in British Columbia and Canada, assuming the hornets travel under their own wing power, similar to the other hornets, they could reach Southern Oregon in 13 years. Whoa. Next. If they spread at a maximum rate and hitch ride on vehicles or get spread some other way, that could be reduced to 10 years and up into Alaska on the northern part in 20 years or less. So that's another reason why it's so important for us to report and try and eradicate these here in the United States. Next. Asian giant hornets thrive where it's mild and rainy, and that makes large parts of the North Pacific Northwest prime real estate for them. Farther afield regions of the United States, including along the East Coast, could support them, but it's unlikely that the insects can fly there on their own. So, um, again, the matter means we still really don't know a lot about what they're going to do in the United States, but any of the data that they can collect helps out. Next. By looking at the habitat conditions, including rainfall and temperature, the hornets prefer in their native range of Japan, South Korea, China, and the East Asian countries. The scientists studying them map region in the United States where the hornets might be able to survive. Then the researchers simulated the insect spread using information on how their smaller relative invaded Europe. That hornet spread at an average rate of about 100 kilometers per year. Next, environmental ethics. The hornet's nearly two inches long with a three inch wingspan, slightly smaller than the European hornet, but it's much more aggressive. One Asian hornet can kill 40 bees in a minute. A handful can destroy, destroy an entire hive of 30,000 bees in a couple of hours. That's the biggest reason we don't want them in the United States. It will destroy our honeybee industry. They will, if, if something comes too close to their nest, they will send out a lone bee to kind of scare them um it will fly at you it might sting you if you don't move off fast enough then a whole bunch is going are going to come out and sting their average lifespan of the worker is 30 to 55 days next we talked a little bit about the stinger earlier it injects an especially potent venom that contains like many wasp villains a, cytolic, a cytolytic peptide. It can damage the tissue by stimulating a phospholase, a phospholipase action in addition to its own phospholipase. An entomologist at the Tamawaga University described being stung as feeling like a hot nail being driven into his leg. And then again, besides using their venom, they can spray into a person's eyes and that can damage your eyes. But you can see that stinger there. 
Um, and they will, when, when hornets, hornets are nasty things, all of them have tempers and they don't mess around. Um, if you come within two to three feet, one will come out and kind of buzz you. And if you don't move or you don't get out of the way, then a bunch come. And these guys are just that much more aggressive. The venom contains a neurotoxin. Um, it's a single chain polypeptide, and you can see some of the chemical analysis of it here in the picture. While a single wasp cannot inject a lethal dose, multiple stings can be lethal, even to people who are not allergic, <clears throat> if the dose is big enough. Allergy to the venom is greatly increased the risk of death. I'm one of those. I've gotten stung enough when I was younger that I'm allergic to a plano wasp sting. This one sting on this could be potentially lethal for me. Um, tests involving mice found that the venom falls a little bit short of being the most lethal of all wasp venom, but the potency is due to the large amount of venom that it, inject, it injects compared to the amount injected by other types of species. So when they sting, they put a lot of stuff into you compared to some of the others. The therapies that we use for other wasp stings, prophylactic immunotherapy, that may work, may not work for rendering a venom. Um, we don't, we're not doing a lot of testing with this. We don't want people getting stung, but there's, if you want more information on that and how they use that, there's a couple of websites there. Next. <clears throat> Reporting again in Washington state, they should report to the Washington state department of agriculture website. And it's going to come up here. Next. Outside of Washington, contact your state apiary inspector. If it's safe to do so, collect the specimen. If not, don't do it, just report it. In Kansas, this is our reporting site. And this, this presentation will be on the K-State website that you can pull this information back up. Next, and there's his email. We do have a natural parasite of wasps and hornets. I'm going to stop before I go into that. Anybody have some questions to this point? So you mentioned that. No, okay. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that they can also shoot like venom at their. Mm -hmm. How do they, does that come from the stinger or out of their mouth or? Comes out of their mouth. It's kind of like spitting. Yeah. Okay. And, and Ooh. it's a, it's a, um, I didn't find a, that when I put this together, I didn't find much more on that. I don't know whether it's a very fine spray or whether when it's released, it's like a gas. I didn't. I, that was one of my questions, but I couldn't find anything on that at this point, other than I found one Chinese, very scientific paper on it and went, uh, that's way above my head. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But so I don't know. I'm guessing that it's either a very fine mist or turns to gas in the air because otherwise it would not, I mean, if they're going by, they're, it's not going to come into your right. eyes that easy. But that, that's about all I can tell. But um, the person that they studied in Japan lost his eyesight and they did not regain it. Um, and they're studying what it is about that that does damage the eyes, whether it's an acid base or just what, don't know. Kind of unique. I had not heard of any other wasps, bees doing that. Okay, natural, na uh, natural parasite of these in all Hymenoptera are the Streptocerin wasps. Um, 
in the study of the parasites among the species of wasps, about 4.3% of the Asian giant hornet females were parasitized. The males were not parasitized. Um, they prefer the female. The major consequences of having this parasite is they cannot reproduce. Um, and so the queens um, also get to the point where they cannot feed with this parasite and they die. They don't search for an area to create a new colony to feed and feed on sap in the early July. So they disappear. Um, in other species of Wasps, the males also have a chance of being parasitized, but they have not found them in the males of the Asian giant hornets to this point. Um, but regardless, if they are parasitized, then they cannot reproduce. And this, this looks big. This little thing is teeny tiny, about the size of the head of a pin. Here's another picture of it. Here is the form that it, it is as a parasite inside the wasp. And there, if you want to look some more about them, there's a website. Next, they look kind of like little aliens. They have nine families and about 600 species. They are endoparasites, which means they are inside the wasps. They do bees, wasps, leafhoppers, silverfish, and cockroaches. Females of most species never emerge from the host after entering the body. Um, and finally dying inside it. The early stage larvae do emerge because they have to find an unoccupied host and the males must emerge to go seek a female to reproduce. That's kind of the underside. And here you can see that little parasite in between the segments of the host. And just that little end sticking out. Um. With the with that weird uh things with the weird parasites wing wing like things is it like fins or is it just wings? Those are wings. That's the adults. They stay in that little worm like stage when they're parasite parasite in the wasp. Um, they they will emerge to fly off and find another host. Like if this is a new one, it would come out develop into the wings and fly off to find another host, or if it's a male, it flies off to find a female to breed, and then the female will lay her eggs on the host. It will hatch into the larva that it feeds. Next. <clears throat> Surprisingly, in its natural habitat, the Asian giant hornet is a threatened species. Um, their habitat is their forests in their natural countries are being cut down for agriculture to make way for fields to plant other things. So they're losing their habitat and they are threatened in their natural countries. We just don't want them here, but they're, they're considered a threatened species in their natural countries. Next. Um, I'm going to stop here. There's, there's several slides here of my references. Most of this came from the Washington State Agricultural Site. More, most of the other stuff are where I got pictures and things from. I have one other reference that's not on here. Um, my middle son, who was a state entomology winner in Kansas when he was in 4-H, is now a um, Sergeant First Class in the Army, stationed at Fort Lewis in Washington State. And he has talked with the Washington Agriculture Group up there and talked to them about the hornets and things. And he's tried to get me a specimen for education, but they're not letting any go out at this point. They're keeping them all for their research and sending them in and genetic testing. But um, last month, there was a hive of about 50 specimens found. That means that a queen from last year had wintered over and started a new hive. Um, they did find that and eliminated it, but that does mean that there are still some producing hives up in that area somewhere. 
Um, so they do not have them eradicated yet. Um, they, they are still optimistic that they're not going to spread a long way because again, food sources, there has to be the oak, enough oak trees to provide the sap in the spring. And they don't like being around a lot of people. So potentially they're going to stay state parks or areas where are not highly populated. Um, any other questions? Donna, if you want to go ahead to the next slide that has a picture of the wasp on it, they, the references are there if you guys want to look at them later on. Okay, these next few slides, um, the Asian giant hornet is over here on the right hand side of the slide. On the left hand side are going to be some species that are kind of look alike. This is our western cicada killer, your Asian giant hornet there on the right. They're pretty close to the same size. Okay, next. That's the one in western Kansas. Next. That's the one here in eastern Kansas. Next. This is the European hornet. It isn't quite as big as this one. Doesn't have as many stripes as the Asian giant hornet. Next. These are a lot of our yellow jacket species we see in the United States. They are not as big. They are similar colors, but they still don't have the banding and they're not near as big. Next. Great golden digger wasp. I don't know why some people confuse this one because it is a thread wasted wasp. Between the thorax and the abdomen, there's the little tiny piece in here, but some people evidently do. And a totally different antenna type than our the Asian giant hornet. This is an elm sawfly. Look at the difference in the antennas here. That would be a big clue that it's not a hornet. Next. These are some of our paper wasps. They have some similar markings, but again, they're a whole lot smaller. Next. Ball-faced hornet, nasty little creatures that we have here. But again, it's mainly black and yellow. Next. Pigeon tree mix, it's longer than the Asian giant hornet, but a whole lot more slender. And the female has the ovipositor, like on the end of the abdomen of this one. Next. Bumblebees, whole different body type, no main waist. Next. And our honeybee, La big difference there. Okay, Donna, if you wanna take the slideshow off. Last Monday night, someone asked about other things they could do for educational displays. Tonight, you've seen a slideshow. You can do that, put it on a zip drive and submit it to the fair as a display. Monday night I mentioned the collection notebook. And I'm gonna put this up here, kind of so you can see, right quick. And I find a good, you take pictures of insects and then on the bottom of the page, you put the information of the order, the common name, your date locality, just like you do insects there. Information for that is on the Kansas 4-H website on how to make that. Um, see if I can get this one to where you can kind of see. You're not gonna be able to see it real good. 
but this is a diorama made in just a shoe box and this has the life cycle of the monarch butterfly in it um there's ones laying eggs there's the chrysalis up here um all kinds of different things that works for an educational display i think you've all probably maybe made a mobile in school those work very well posters work very well those all now are entered in the entomology department and judged by someone from entomology not self-determined so those are some other alternatives you can use for your displays we hope to see more of those um, games all kinds of things that you can use any other questions tonight okay friday night sharon dobish will be doing a presentation on different types of invasive species and um i'm sure she'll have a really good presentation it'll be a lot of fun we're glad you all joined us hopefully next summer we're planning on going back to in-person two days of insect spectacular with lots of fun and games we hope to make it in we're very glad you joined us this evening Thank you, Vicki, so much. This has been so informative and I I truly learned a lot about this that I, I did not know. So I appreciate this. And like Vicki mentioned, if you have questions about what you can put in the fair, there's so many options. So check into it. And if you have any other questions, you can email her or call her, her information's in the chat, or you can call our state 4-H office as well. So um, let us know if you have any questions and we'd be happy to help you. And thank you again and hope to see you Friday.